Let me just say a little bit about what I'm going to try to do today, and uh, then we'll jump in. There's so much stuff to cover. And uh, I want to give you a little introduction to the wider project in which this reflection today fits. Um, and to give you a little idea about what we can uh, hope to achieve today and what we can't. Um, how many of you have heard uh, ones, uh, even the, uh, the uh, introductory set of lectures on uh, rediscovering masculine potentials that the Institute uh, has of my lectures on the four masculine archetypes? Most of you have not. So that means I'm going to have to go over that uh, structure uh, pretty intensively. So, so what we'll try to do uh, in the morning session this morning, I'm going to try to, to get through uh, the basic layout of uh, the issues, the, the structures as I see them in the self, and, uh, and a description of the different, uh, the different issues that I see in masculine initiation. Many of you are women, and uh, what I will try to do is to. I'm not, I'm, going, I'm not going to talk about much about the female psyche. I will uh, encourage you, however, to reflect on the issues uh, that that this discussion raises for uh, feminine individuation, because uh, you will be able to see close parallels to issues that women are facing today. And uh, uh, I don't want to get into focusing on feminine psychology. Other people are doing that a lot today, but uh, we can certainly look at some of the interfacing uh, issues. Um, so uh, let me just say a bit about myself and my work and the large project that this is a part of. Uh, uh, I am a Jungian psychoanalyst practicing here in Evanston in Chicago, and I'm a professor of psychology and religion at the Chicago Theological Seminary. Uh, before I was a, a Jungian analyst, I was an Adlerian analyst, and before that I wrote, my first book was a Freudian book. Uh, so uh, I, have, uh, I have been one of those slow learners, you know. It took me a long time to get around to Jung. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to start with today is talking about why Jung, as opposed to other systems of thought for today. And uh, just brief comments about that, what led me there, and, uh, and what the nature of my work has been. I see myself in the tradition of uh, what are known today as classical Jungians. Uh, that is to say, I do not identify with... Uh, with the wings in Jungian thought today who uh, have jettisoned Jung's basic structure of the self. Uh, I believe with Jung that there is a collective unconscious, what he called an objective psyche. I believe it really exists, and I believe it has enormous clinical uh, and political implications uh, for the human race. And I follow if you the people that I that that are most that are closest to, to my way of thinking uh, that you can read a lot about in addition to Jung are, are the work the works of Edward Edinger. In fact, if you have not had a chance to read Edinger's works, particularly his book Ego and Archetype, uh, it's a very key book. I do not see my work as diverging significantly from Jung at all. I see my work as continuing a lot of the investigations that he was engaged in, and uh, I will say something about uh, 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 the theoretical implications of that in a little bit. But it really matters, what I want to start with is, from my point of view, it really matters what your meta-theoretical assumptions are in psychoanalysis and psychology. Because if you don't believe there's a deep self, then that has enormous ramifications for your interpretation of the psyche and your understanding of what therapy is and how therapy ought to proceed and what you can expect in therapy. And so there's a lot of movement in Jungian psychology today, and I have been one to applaud it, to, to build bridges to other schools of psychoanalysis. 
You know, Jungian, Jungian psychology in relation to object relations theory, Jungian psychology in relation to self-psychology, Jungian psychology in relation to cognitive psychotherapy, so forth and so on. And I applaud that because I don't think we ought to be uh, 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 uninformed about other schools of thought and of what they have to offer us. Jung certainly was not. He was a Freudian psychoanalyst. Uh, so uh, and knew Adler well and used Adler's concepts. So uh, I think that's a laudable thing. But what I've begun to be concerned about, which I'm surprised at, I'm, I'm concerned about the tendency in many institutes today to, to not really focus on Jung's central, most important achievements. And recently I was uh, at the International Congress in Paris of Jungian analysts and I was fascinated and a bit disturbed by how few uh, addresses there really address the deep psyche. I mean, we, we had a lot of lectures that could have been given by Kleinians or could have been given by object relations theorists. There wasn't anything showing the importance of Jung's contribution. So I, I want to say today uh, stewarding Jung's contribution is very important, and I, I would like to uh, have us look closely at this whole idea of the deep psyche. So I am one, and here's where it ties into this whole issue of masculine maturity, and you can see the way it would relate to feminine maturation issues too. I'm one that believes there's a blueprint in the deep psyche, and I believe that uh, that one must attend to these deep structures if one is, number one, to understand anything about the potential of the human psyche, much less developing it, much less healing it. You, you have to get some sense about what the, the, the uh, crystalline structure of the psyche is. You have to get some idea about what the blueprints, the architectural blueprints for the development of the psyche are before you can begin to assess any particular personality. So in other words, it has, for clinical, those of you who are clinicians, it has enormous significance, in my view, for clinical assessment. We have entirely too many people today, including a lot of Jungian analysts, I fear, who, when it comes down to clinical practice, have great difficulty in identifying an archetypal pattern in a particular personality and have difficulty in understanding when they're assessing a personality what archetypal possessions may be existing in that personality at a particular time. So in other words, uh, I think it's a very important thing for Jungian psychology today to do serious work on continuing Jung's project of decoding the structure, the deep structure of the psyche. And uh, that is what my work for the last, particularly for the last 17 years, uh, has been focused upon. I didn't start out to do that in my work. Uh, what I really started out to do in about 1973 was to write a Jungian psychology of the occult. And I was doing a lot of field work at the time on occultism going around interviewing occultists and practicing magicians and so forth. And what happened at that time was that I began to study the, uh, what I've come to call the archetype of the magician and the phenomena that arise any time you get the magician archetype. And I'll go into this a little more later this morning. Uh, but anyway, I was fascinated by their ritual practice and I was fascinated with their concern for sacred space. And I was also fascinated by their attention to the concept of initiation, all of them. No matter what school, whether they followed Crowley or whether they were witches in Wicca, or what particular tradition of magic they followed, they had an interest in initiation and stages of initiation. So I began to see the relationship between initiation, sacred space, and the archetype of the magician. I have a book that finally is just about after 17 years going to come out called The Magician and the Analyst, uh, which looks at ritual, sacred space, and psychotherapy, probably 1991 come out. But uh, it started in that work then. 
But my, but my work on sacred space led me into looking at the incredibly creative work of John Weir Perry on the self and psychotic process. And if you haven't seen his books, those books are tremendously important and not outdated even today. Uh, particularly his book, Roots of Renewal and Myth and Madness. Now, I had no particular interest in the king archetype at all. But I said, well, I've got to study this liminality. I've got to study this sacred space and see what happens in that kind of transformative space. So I went to the man who knew the most about that, John Perry. You get into John Perry, you find out what happens when the psyche is dissolving in this liminal change, transitional state. John Perry says, what appears? The king and a quadrated order. So I said, uh-oh, I've got to study the king. So I started studying the king. And uh, 90 pages of bibliography on the king later, I began to realize that in every king I ever studied, I began to notice something. Not only do they have a magician with them, they've always got warriors with them. So at the Jung Institute back some years ago, I offered the first course on the masculine, masculine psychology. I'm probably the first one that had been offered in a long time. And in that course, it was entitled King, Warrior, Magician. See, See I, was still, I still hadn't discovered the fourth. And uh, began to look closer at the Camelot stories began to look closer at the comparative mythological studies of Campbell and others and began to notice the uh, predominance in all of these, uh, these uh, images and cross-cultural traditions of Eros, the lover archetype, which is always present, always problematic in all these, in all these stories. And so began to... to uh, to realize that that had to be included and began to study that. As a good typical male, uh, the lover archetype is not one of the easiest ones for men to understand very well, unless they're borderlines. If they're a borderline male, they tend to know a lot about the lover archetype, or an addictive male. Uh, so. Uh, so anyway, that was the progression of the work over more than a decade. And so uh, now there have been uh, a series of uh, five lecture series which elaborate uh, my understanding of the, the uh, structure of the male psyche, and uh, all of them available through the Institute, beginning with the introductory series, uh, Rediscovering Masculine Potentials, and then a series on the king and the warrior and the magician and the lover. Some of you have seen some of those. Uh, a series of a five-volume uh, series of books on masculine psychology will be, begin coming out in the fall. The first volume is just the introduction, uh, Rediscovering the Archetypes of the Mature Masculine, and it's, the main title is King, Warrior, Magician, Lover. We published by HarperCollins. Uh, they tell me in November. That'll be the overview. William Morrill Press will bring out uh, the, what I what. Uh, Douglas Gillette, my co-author, who's a mythologist and been working on these volumes with me to elaborate the cross-cultural symbolism and so forth, historical stuff. Uh, uh, we, we, we finally call it the Male Quartet, a volume on each of the archetypes will be brought out by Morrow, William Morrow Press, probably starting in 1991. They're all written, they're all in press, and we're in the process of revising them now. So anyway, this has been a long process. I told Tony uh, a while ago that I feel like a woman in the ninth month who just began labor. And uh, it's a crazy time when you're trying to do editing on more than one, even one book. But when you're trying to do editing on five books uh, at the same time, it's a, it's pain. So you catch me in that particular time. So if I act a little strange, just, you know, treat me like somebody in labor. So. <laughs> But anyway, so uh, let me uh, let me then uh, 
go fast here because we've got a lot of ground to cover and I would like to get the basic structural things out and the issues out this morning before before we break it uh, before we take our lunch break at 12:30 we'll take a short break uh, stretch break uh, in about 45 minutes uh, but I'd like to get the basic structural elements and the issues out before we take our lunch break and then you'll have that time to think about it the issues then we'll come back and and bring the key questions you have and we will start off uh, working on uh, working on the implications and so forth then and try to deepen it and I will also try to help you look at the issue the clinic for those of you who are clinicians and those of you who are particularly worried and concerned about your own individuation, the practical implications of this structural system for 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 uh, getting the most movement with the least libido, you know, which is always a human uh, concern. Uh, so anyway, we'll look at more of the practical, developmental, and therapeutic issues this afternoon. Uh, and uh, uh, so that's if if it's all right with you, that's the way I'd like to proceed. Okay. Now. I have I have started with the issue of decoding and I use the word decoding the male psyche and decoding the structure of the self very intentionally because people have asked me you know uh, some people treat archetypes like they were simply metaphors or you know somebody's going to come up and they come up say the archetype of the hunter like the hunter is an archetype well, in my view, the hunter is not an archetype at all. Uh, and uh, and uh, the, the view that I'm wanting to communicate by the, the use of the word decoding is that these are structures, they are what they are, and uh, they're not all over the place. And everything that somebody that calls themselves a Jungian says is an archetype is not necessarily an archetype, and certainly not a major archetype in the structural uh, building of the psyche. So uh, when I use this word decoding, I am asserting uh, what I believe to be true. That is to say, there is a fundamental structure to the deep self. There are many archetypes. If you follow the Platonic tradition, practically everything is an archetype. But you know, if everything is an archetype, then it, makes no, it has no practical significance for anything. And there are a lot of people that use the concept of archetype in a way that's so loose it means nothing. I don't want to identify with that group. Uh, <clears throat> let me suggest to you that we follow Jung here. And what I want to suggest is that my work, I have tried to continue to decode stuff that he's already worked on ad nauseum. Those of you that, that had a chance to look at this, you need to really look carefully. Some of you have had a chance to be in some of the courses on the structure of the self this, week, this previous week. This is ION, Volume 9-2. <clears throat> and uh, when I was working on trying to come up, and Doug Gillette and I were working on trying to come up with images to communicate these, the things that we believe to be true about the deep self, uh, I remember one time, I, if you listen to that first set of tapes, uh, there, there, I mean, there's, there's a guy on there who says, Robert, I think it's a pyramid. And, and, uh, and I said, no, no. That, you know, he said, you know, the, the king is on top. That's what, that's what got me confused. See, the king's on top. And uh, I said, no, no, that's not it. And so I never got back to this pyramidal in, uh, image for the uh, structure of the self at all for a long time. But finally, later on, when I began to realize Jung's emphasis on the quaternio. And that's one of the things you've got to get. If you don't know what that is, we've got to get you clear about what that's talking about in Jung's work today. But uh, if you don't own the 20th volume, the index of Jung's collected works, you need to get you a copy of that. And I always tell people who are serious students of Jung, don't buy this stuff in, in, in soft-bound copies. Get you a hardback copies of the collected works. That'll communicate something to yourself, you know, how seriously you take yourself as a scholar of this stuff. But anyway, look at the 20th volume and turn in there to, under the word quaternio and look at the incredible amount of work that Jung put in to the phenomenology of the fourfold structures in the human psyche. Now, Jung's have, Jungians have talked about that a lot. 
they have tended to reduce that to typological studies, you know, the different, uh, the, the book on psychological typology, as if that is the key to the quaternio. Uh, well, that was a good stab at it in my view, but I don't think that's what it was. But anyway, finally, when we were working on trying to get some images for this, we said, I said, pyramid. Maybe a double pyramid for the masculine and the feminine. And I felt so good for a while there. I hadn't looked at this for a while. And then I opened that up. Blew my mind completely. Here's Jung back in the work laying out all these diagrams on double quaternios for the structure of the self. In other words, Jung says, Jung says, in, a, in, in effect, Jung says, this is the structure of the human self. This is the structure of the archetype of self. He said, but you read the chapters, he says, I can't quite figure out what the different parts of it are. Well, there's, there's lapis, and there's earth, and there's water, and there's rotundrum, and there's uh, serpent, and there's Hittadel, and there's Euphrates, and there's Lapis, and there's Gibran. You know, he's got all these Gnostic terms and everything, but he's working really hard. He's fascinated. He, he knows that there's a deep structure, and he knows that that's an image of it. Uh, he knows it's related to all the traditional quaternios. Earth, air, fire, water. Tell me some more traditional quaternios in the... Uh, in traditional systems. You got earth, air, fire, water. What else you got? Any any cultural tradition, any mythic tradition? Four seasons. You got four seasons. Four directions. Yeah, why four directions? See everybody takes for granted four directions. Why is it that the human psyche always comes up four directions? There's no uh, clear reason scientifically why you couldn't come up with six directions or twelve directions. See why why does the human psyche say four directions? And uh, what else? Other fours. Four rivers. No, do you know him? Hmm? Four rivers of the f paradise. Of where? Of paradise. paradise. Four rivers of paradise. Very interesting. Four rivers. Today we're going to talk about four rivers. What do the Navajos say? You know anything about Navajo mythology? You want a clear layout of quaternios? Look at Navajo mythology. Particularly the myth that Joseph Campbell worked on so much. How the How the twins came to their father. It's based on quaternio, quaternio structure. And it's fascinating with, with, you look at Navajo sand paintings, quaternios. And it's very interesting, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get into this a little bit later today. Uh, for all practical purposes, in my view, uh, what you end up with and it, from, from looking at this stuff is that there are actually four, four different kind of expressions, four forms of human libido takes. Uh, the Navajos understood it first. They talked about the four snakes. There are four different snakes. And you see there are four different snakes in a lot of their different paintings. And uh, of course, if there's no deep structure to the psyche, those are just interesting images that the Navajos came up with. They, were just, they just had a thing for rattlesnakes because they lived out in the desert. But it's very interesting. When they're developing, when they have this male initiation story, uh, they start out with two. After a certain level of development and maturation, there are four. And the last secret painting in the initiation cycle, in this Navajo myth of initiation, has four mountains, different colors, and there are four men standing on the top of the four mountains. And that was the most secret initiation picture. They were not going to tell it to this anthropologist that was, that was interviewing them about this story. And this anthropologist simply had gotten enough information that she knew that this was not complete. What she had been told was not complete. And she says, where is the other one? She says, where is the other picture? There's another picture. And this so impressed her, her understanding of the system, so impressed the Navajo teacher that she was interviewing, was her informant, that he, that he says, okay, I'll show you. 
And so the final, the final picture he showed her was this picture. And you can see it in Joseph Campbell's book, Transformations of Myth Through Time. That, that cycle is laid out in that book, Transformations of Myth Through Time, that, Campbell rec that was recently published posthumously by Campbell's, I mean, by Campbell's uh, estate. But anyway, four colors, four snakes, four directions. Uh, just, just sometime this week, get that index and look under Quaternio. See, what a lot of contemporary Jungians don't do they, do, they do not pay any attention to what incredible scholarship went into Jung's work. And I mean historical scholarship, comparative anthropological scholarship, comparative mythological scholarship. See, why are not more people interested in becoming Jungian psychologists? Well, there are a lot of people that have real simple answers for that that are wrong. The reason it is so uh, uh, unpopular is because it takes too damn much work to become a Jungian psychologist. See, you can, you can get to be an initiated Adlerian or initiated Freudian in all the different schools pretty quick in terms of your theoretical studies. You can reduce everything to penis envy, see, right? Or you can reduce everything to the Oedipal complex. Or you can reduce everything to the narcissistic self-object uh, failures. But you see, if you're Jungian, you can't do that. And so it requires an immense amount of work. Jung pioneered it. Jungians ought to emulate it. Say, so, yeah. Didn't he find a lot of this in the dream symbols? Yes, yes, he did. Yes, he did. But the, the, and, and that's very important because that is a way of saying this is in there in the hardwiring. This is not merely cultural. But the only point I was trying to make was that Jung was an incredible scholar of comparative culture. And one cannot be a Jungian theorist without being a scholar of comparative culture. And anybody that tries to be is going to end up being a Jungian pietist. You know, simplistic mind, simplistic thinker, and uh, anything that moves they'll call an archetype and write a little book on the archetype of this or the archetype of that. Or they'll, they'll call, uh, I won't get too personal about this, but... Uh, <laughs> but but there are a lot of things out there in the literature that you really need to have your bullshit indicator working real well because they're they're calling things archetypes that I don't think are all, at all archetypes in Jung's sense of the word archetype. So anyway, let me just do some imaging for you here. Jung had this like this, the double quaternio. He never really thought of these double pyramids as one being masculine, one being feminine. My guess is that this is the way the double quaternio is in the deep self. My argument would be, there is your image of the God self, Imago Dei, in geometrical patterns. What are the faces? In terms of my, my work, and I really do believe this is the way it is, you get the king and the queen. You get the warrior couple. In other words, the ancient Egyptians said there were eight couples of gods and goddesses that came on the creation. I think they were right. King and queen, warrior couple. Priest and priestess couple. Notice where the magician archetypes are structurally in relationship to the king and queen. Directly opposed. Now, I don't think that's accidental. I don't think that is, I don't think that, it, that any sophisticated case can be made that that's arbitrary. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to show you why clinically and developmentally. Okay, so we got king and queen, we've got the warrior couple, we've got the magician or priest, priestess couple. On the other side, across, directly across in an opposition from what? What is this across from? The lo the lo okay, the warriors are here. This is the lover couple. In other words, what you've got is a psychological structure which has built in two fundamental oppositions, two fundamental dialectical oppositions, not one, like Freud thought. 
Jung said, it's interesting to me to look at Freud and Adler argue. Freud is always saying, there's this opposition in the psyche between the lover and the warrior, the eros and thanatos, eros and aggression. Adler, always emphasizing power, hierarchical power, versus a kind of a sense of social interest. And Jung says, isn't it interesting that you can take any clinical case, which he would do, he'd be sitting with them watching them talk about this. Adler could, could discuss any clinical case in terms of the power, social interest dialectic, king, queen, magicians. See, the prophet, I'll get into this more in a little, the, the, the prophet, cultural prophet, is in the quadrant of the magician. Nathan the prophet is in the archetypal pattern of the magician. Okay. So Jung says, isn't it interesting that these guys can discuss cases and never agree on what's going on, but they both sound right to me, Jung said. Now what did Jung say then? He says, well, it must be a matter of psychological typology. In other words, this must be a perceptual problem caused by a difference in the typology of Freud and Adler. So then he developed his psychological typology theory based on that to explain this difference. You see, I think he should have stayed with his theory more closely. That opposition doesn't just exist in perception. That opposition exists in the deep structure of the self itself. That is to say, when you try to reduce the dynamic problems in the deep structure of the self to one axis, you won't get it. They're both right, but there are two dynamic oppositions in the deep structure of the psyche, not one. See. Do you follow that? Now, I ask a questions about this now. King, queen, warrior couple, magician couple, lover couple. We're going to want to lay this out in diagrams for you a little bit, but you see what I mean? I'm saying that this is what you would want to talk about. This is the, in Jungian psychology, Marion Woodman says that she's right. That is the deep archetypal self. When a Jungian that knows what they're talking about is talking about the archetypal self, it is both sexes. In the deep self, in the deep archetypal self, this is in your hard wiring. Now, talk about gender issues. This creates a little problem for you. Freud and a lot of them saw it. There is a basic, deep kind of bisexuality in the hardwiring. See, and so if you want to understand a lot of gender dif confusion problems, we get it honest. <laughs> it's in there. Depending on whether you're a male or female, we can say, well, what is this shadowy mysterious thing here, obsidian. Well, it depends. If, it's, if you're a male, that's femininity. <laughs> if you're a female, that's masculinity. Now, I'm just express my, I'm an opinionated man. My opinion is that it doesn't ever get too much better than that. That is to say, males will always have a deep, deep problem plumbing the depths of the female psyche in them or in the outer world. They can learn something about its shape. They can try to develop their empathy. They can learn to love through, through developing the lover dimensions of their psyche and their capacities for empathy. They can learn to give sensitive attunement to the other. But Knowing the female psyche like a woman, never, in my view. I don't think that is possible to be done. And I think the reverse is also true. And uh, so in other words, those people who are into this androgyny fantasy, I think are, are if when I'm feeling kind, I say they're just misguided and simplistic in their thinking. <laughs> when I'm not feeling kind, I say they're probably very narcissistic because 
they've got some fantasy that they can have the completeness in themselves without the other. And my basic sense is that the mystery, if you look at this, in my view, and we'll be talking about initiation, individuation, and maturation. In my view, initiation and individuation, you can image it as coming toward the apex of this pyramid, toward true individuation and integration of the facets. The mature man and woman come into clarity of differentiation and integration. That is to say, you think about codependency in this. When you heal your codependency, you know there is another. And there's a tremendous eros field that's formed. When you've got a, what Jung called a homorphodictic union, that is a bogus pseudo-union, there is no energy field. So when you're working with somebody clinically who has no erotic energy available to them, there are some bogus hermorphodytic androgynous unions in their psyche. There is not that kind of mature differentiation. I like to say to, man, to a man, a man tells me he has no, he has no sexuality, you know, blah, blah, I'm wooden, I'm dead. I say, you got to get in touch with that male ape in there because that male ape knows he's not a female ape. And that male ape in there has a receptor in him for female apes. And there will be an energy field when adequate differentiation exists. And uh, so, uh, so in other words, the model for maturation is integration, differentiation, so there can be relationship. Think about this in terms of those of you who know some, some self-psychology. Think about, think about archaic self-object fusions. Differentiation toward more mature self-object relationships are what the classical Freudians would call object relationships. I can experience an object, a real other person. You follow that? Okay, now that's why. Go ahead. within the person are you differentiating on one pole there yes i want to, that's what i want to get to now we've been talking about the deep archetypal self the deep archetypal self with a capital s is like this in my view your human ego in jung's terms or little s self has to be built like this. In other words, the structure of the archetypal deep self is eightfold. It's a double quaternio, as Jung puts it. The, when you become human and not God, see, the, when you stop being total, complete in yourself, you start incarnating, you start becoming human, then you have a quaternio structure. You have the fourfold structure. And what you're trying to do is to develop your human self, which is, uh, which is this type of shape, which I'm going to stay with today because I'm not going to talk about the female side of this much. But you can use your, your analogical powers See, I'm not one of those Jungians that, that goes with that Victorian notion that Freud and Jung had that uh, assertiveness is masculine and receptivity is feminine. See, Or eros is feminine and logos is masculine. See, that's a, that is what the, the feminist theorists have hated that, rightfully so, I think. And I think if you understand the wiring, the hard wiring in the psyche, you can get beyond that. You can see why you can get beyond that and have a much fuller understanding of these different potentials in the psyche. For example, a lot of the time males are expected to carry, in traditional patriarchal culture, males are expected to carry the warrior for everybody. A lot of the time they're dumped on for it, 
but they are expected to carry it. Females are expected to carry the lover in patriarchal culture. And this kind of archetypal splitting, I call that archetypal splitting, makes everybody crazy. And it, make, it puts everyone into a sadomasochistic arrangement. A crazy sadomasochistic arrangement. So in other words, uh, just a word to the women. I think if you look carefully at this, that you can plot the structure of patriarchy archetypally as an archetypal splitting in which women were not to be a fully empowered queen and they were not to be a fully empowered warrior. And so today when I'm working with a woman who needs to be empowered and liberated and uh, to take control of her life, and I say, you've got to work with warrior queen images, it's a very difficult business because in patriarchy, we try to destroy and trash all images of warrior queens. We try to say those are masculine women. They are not masculine women. They're warrior queens. And uh, so it's very interesting. If you haven't seen this Antonia Frazier book on warrior queens, you should look at that because it picks up some historical treatments of this, of this organization. But anyway, so the fullness of the masculine and the fullness of the feminine, I think, are both fourfold in nature and they, are, they carry the same energies. They carry them differently, of course. How do you know how they carry them differently? Well, you study women. You study men. You know, you study, you, you take this stuff seriously as biological, biocultural research. And you, you look at, you try to find people who embody, that's another thing I'd like to say about the way you work with the issue of maturity. You try to find people who embody the energy, the power of the particular quadrant fully, as fully as you can see it. And then you study that. In other words, we're not dealing with religious mysticism here. We're trying to do biocultural kinds of research. Okay, of course somebody had a question. Yeah. Um, what are the implications of what you're saying for the concepts of the animus and the animus? It broadens it radically. That, that, did you hear the question? The, the traditional Victorian view of anima and animus, which has dominated Jungian thought for years, and many Jungians, particularly those coming out of Zurich, still kind of are into that. In my view, if you really understand this thing in terms of the deep structures, the double quaternio, you see that Jung <laughs> was working uh, a splitting, an archetypal split in his view of the feminine. That is to say, if you, in my view, if you fill out the concept of the anima, you're simply talking about, in a man, you're talking about the, the hidden feminine in his deep wiring, which he has got to learn about and learn to love and learn to make a space for in his experience. And we can get into that this afternoon. What happens when a man, see, look at this, what happens when a man cannot make space for the warrior feminine in his life? What happens when he becomes terrified at, a war, at the warrior feminine? You see, that if he is not comfortable with the warrior feminine, we can say he is not developed in that sector of his anima. You follow that? And the reverse would be true for a woman. In other words, you have to look at your experience of contrasexual, uh, the experience of the contrasexual, and say, what energies of femininity or masculinity am I the least comfortable with? What energies do I find myself driven to try to shame? What energies of the feminine or the masculine am I the most interested in trying to say are really pathological? Uh, and uh, you get, let me, let me get into one of my pet peeves here. Uh, ever since Freud, we have, we have depreciated warrior energy. It, the depreciation of warrior energy is built into psychoanalytic theory, Freudian psychoanalytic theory. And it has enormous implications uh, for all sorts of things. Uh, uh, but, uh, 
but uh, in particularly in certain uh, 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 social groups, the the warrior archetype is totally in the shadow. People have nothing good to say. I have a lot of people come up to me and say, you know, you shouldn't call this the warrior archetype. I, oh yeah. Uh, why is that? Well, we know war is bad, and uh, and you should call it the explorer. You know, or you should call it the hunter, or something like that, which of course doesn't capture at all the energy that is in that. You know, I mean. <laughs> So, uh, so there's a, you look at the family, and here's one of the things you do when you're thinking about individuation. You look at your culture, and then you look at your family, and then you look at the birth order that you had in your family, and then you look at what that meant for what archetypal potential was blessed for you and welcomed, and what you were expected to split off and demonize. Uh, it's very complicated. You have to look your culture. If you're Irish, it's not the same as if you're Italian. If you're Jewish, it's not the same as if you're, uh, uh, you know, Southern Wasp. Uh, so you have to look at your culture carefully, and then you have to look at the family system. But you got to look at your place in it, because. You know, birth order, the Adlerians make all this stuff about birth order. It even influences what is okay for you. The Adlerians are, are fond of pointing out that, uh, that the youngest child will often become very charming and seductive. Well, in other words, they get sanctioned in the lover sector of the psyche a lot more. Yes? When you talk about the energy, um, I have some questions about is the wiring including the amount of energy that one has as a person so that it's a fixed amount or is it a variable? Or it's a very complicated. The whole issue of dynamics is very complicated and we can talk a little bit about that but that's a complicated question. Uh, I'm going to I'm, I'm working on that a lot now. Do you understand if you're not a psychologist you may not know the sophistication of this question. It's like the whole question of the nature of libido psychic energy, its forms, and whether or not the psyche is an open system or whether it's a closed energy system, or in what sense is it open and in what sense is it closed. That's a very complicated question and, uh, and one that is uh, it's fascinating and it's been at the heart of the argument between Jungians and Freudians a long time and I can comment on that a little, just a little bit. Uh, next uh, next spring, I'm going to be uh, participating in the Jung in the Jung Centennial at Fordham, and they're focusing on libido issue uh, between Freud and Jung there. And I'm going to lay out this 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 concept of the different forms of libido there. Uh, so I'll be able to 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 write that out a lot more uh, in a complicated way. But uh, clinically, let me just talk about clinically. I mean, when you work at this stuff clinically, you will notice something. If a person is having the, their lover circuits flooded with libido, and you can see this in people who are addicts, addictive personalities are flooded with lover energy, you will notice something. The warrior side of their personality is getting practically no energy. And you will see practically no warrior behaviors in that person. You know, and I'll have to. I'll have to. Crack addicts. And, I mean, what about certain addictions and uh, this, whatever you want to call it, the drug effects themselves? Well, you will see primitive aggression, but that's not a warrior. I mean, there are a lot of boys with AK-47s, but that's see. You got to understand what a warrior is. Initiated warrior. We're talking about. We're talking about the energy. In express in any way that actually serves the purposes of that uh, of that sector, that quadrant. So you know, and there's a lot of people that are very passive, weak people who also are violent. So I mean, the energies are always there. I mean, you know, it, it, there's no way to get away from the energy if you look carefully at the structure. It's always there. If it doesn't come in the front door, it'll come in the back door. But. Uh, but if you if you look at a person, for example, this Saturday I'll be I'll be presenting a workshop on the trickster, 
which in my view is a sector in the magician quadrant of the psyche. Show me, let's just take a man, show me a man who is loaded with trickster energy. You will notice that practically nothing goes into the king quadrant of his life. Practically nothing goes into building anything. See? He has a terrible time getting anything sustained. He can start a million things, but he can't sustain anything. Relationships, businesses, uh, long-term projects, etc. He always starts and then cuts it off, starts and then cuts it off, starts and then cuts it off. So, clinically speaking, now... You know, you have to get into high energy physics if you want to get the, you know, the uh, highly technical stuff. But clinically speaking, it operates as if it is a closed energy system on this, this particular aspect of it. I mean, there are many ways in which the psyche is an open system ecologically with the family system and the environment. But when you're looking at the way in which the quadrated self operates, and you're simply talking clinically, and you're talking about people you're actually working with, you will notice that uh, that uh, the psyche, uh, uh, you will notice that they don't tend to have a whole lot of energy in all the quadrants at the same time unless they're very developed or unless they're very crazy. See, I mean, if they're really psychotic, you may see all sorts of uh, confusion at the same time. And if they're really highly developed, you'll see a person that's very empowered. Let, that gets me to my next issue concept of maturity. Difficulties with, well, most of the time you don't even hear maturity talked about today. I mean, that is a 19th century concept associated with character and uh, things like that. So in, in psychology you tend to not hear too much about it. There have been recent more uh, developmental theories with moral development, cognitive development, so-called faith development, and those things. So they're beginning to look at this again but what you notice in these things is, um, is there, will, there will often be a model for maturation that will, that will be very, uh, what James Hillman calls, monotheistic. That is, there will be a tendency to elevate uh, one kind of value. Say, for example, in classical Freudian theories, the value of autonomy. And so in classical object relations theories, after the Freudian model, maturation will be seen as autonomy. This is what feminist theorists today hate because they think it overvalues isolation and autonomy, and so, of course uh, it, uh, it does. Do you follow that? Classical, classical Freudian theories overvalue, have a vi vision of maturation that's autonomy. Okay. Uh, Self-psychology will have a vision of maturation that has a lot to do with self-esteem, capacity to have healthy self-esteem. And they depreciate the issue of autonomy. <laughs> uh, and so on. You can go on, you can go on uh, a lot of different a lot of different theories on that if we had time. We don't have the time, but one of the interesting things about maturation is that it usually gets defined in such a way that nobody would really want to be it. <laughs> Who wants to be mature? Because we, we normally, in the way that we've, we've talked about this, when we have talked about it, we have defined maturity in such a way that it equates with renunciation and deprivation. And you see this clearly in Freud's vision of civilization and its discontents. That is to say, when you really get mature, you won't get as much <laughs> of anything. You know. In other words, you, you have to give up what they call the infantile wish. Well, you know, if Jung, Jung's vision offers another alternative to that way of thinking. If you don't say so much infantile, if you don't use the word infantile and you use the word archetypal, in many ways what Freudians call infantile and archaic, Jungians call archetypal. That is, people who are Jungians and not 
post Jungians, whatever the hell that is. Uh, but anyway, so if you follow a classical Jungian vision, you do not have to give up the archetypal in order to be mature and individuated. See? And if you haven't studied basic Jungian psychology enough, the, 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 the reason I'm recommending Edinger's book to you is that he emphasizes this concept of, of differentiating from the archetypal self but maintaining a connection with it. What Edinger calls the ego self axis, the ego self connection, which means that you are fueled by the archetypal self but not possessed by it. See? So in other words, uh, Jung's basic theory in itself offers a different vision of maturation. One is much less uh, modeled on deprivation. But in my view, if you if you understand more about the structure of the self and the different kinds of potentials and powers that exist in the psyche for a man and a woman to develop, you will get an even more, more sense of what this concept of wholeness. Everybody talks about wholeness. I have never heard anybody explain it very well. But I think if you understand this, the, 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 the structure of the quaternio and the powers that they represent and you understand that a full maturation involves developing on all these fronts, then you get a sense that's very different about maturation. What is maturity? In other words, I think we can be much more specific about what a mature man is like what a mature man or woman, for that matter, can do than has been the case previously. And one of the interesting things about this that we'll get into a lot more this afternoon is previous models of maturity have emphasized the king and queen, the warrior and the magician stuff to, at the expense of the lover energy in the psyche. In other words, duty, responsibility, you know. Let's give up all that infantile stuff and let's get, you know, smell the coffee and come in and you got to, you know, get down to work here and give up all that fantasy of eros and uh, stuff. And what does that do? Well, it creates the Christian problem. <laughs> Christianity has left the world with this enormous demonic split. The idea that if you're really developed spiritually, you won't have any fun. See? And it's built right into the Christian split. See? And, uh, you know, it, then if you're really a mature woman spiritually, you'll become the bride of Christ and stay away from those human dicks. Because, though, you know what happened to those human dicks? There was some man masturbating with that dick. And we all know that that's terrible. See? Well, once you ever get a clear picture of what the lover initiation in the psyche of a man or a woman is, then you have a chance at healing that Christian split. It's not just Christian. All of the patriarchal religions have it to some degree. Uh, Judaism and Islam slander the feminine less in some ways than Christianity. They all slander it in some way, you know. In patriarchy, you know, this, uh, there's a this thing about, uh, what is that prayer? Thank God that I was not born a woman, you know. If we read that archetypally, we can make some sense out of that thing because what that's about is the fear of the lover archetype in a male psyche. The, the reason that men traditionally have demonized the feminine so much 
is because of, a, uh, of the kind of difficulty that is unique to masculine psychology. You see, in my view, uh, the struggles of the feminine developmental pattern and the struggles of the masculine developmental pattern are not symmetrical. See, I think uh, Carol Gilligan's right about that. I think a lot of the feminine psych feminist psychologists are right about that. Not the same. The, the, the things that women fear are not the same uh, in, in general, are not like things men fear. There's a wonderful book for those of you that are studying masculinity and trying to get your, get your mind around the, the, the differentiations in it that just came out, Yale University Press, by a man by the